Thanks, Marcus, and thanks to everyone for, for coming, coming along and coming from Joe's uh, um, uh, leaving gig as well to, to come and be with, uh, with me today. Um, thanks also to some familiar faces who've heard about this, this project and study in the past. It's nice, um, nice to be able to present again, and hopefully I can, um, I can give you guys some really interesting information here and some, some updates really on the study from those who would have seen it a couple of years ago. So what I'm presenting to you here is the overall title actually for my doctor in, in education thesis, The Dividing Line. Um, but actually what I, what I aim to present today is a segment really of that project, ho hopefully something that's going to be maybe my second or third uh, paper or publication from the overall study if it if all turns out as I hope. Um, looking at those conceptual differences and similarities between bullying, banter and teasing within the elite sporting environment, especially football. So I thought it would be useful at the start of the presentation to give some definitions because actually this was the original stimulus, if you like, for the study. So um, initially, I way back when, when I was starting out my doctor, I was keen to see if I can establish an overall definition of, after reading around of bullying within, within the sporting context, but came to realise that would be a much, much more complicated task than I ever first realised, as I'll, as I'll come to as we go through the presentation at, at the end. Um, but nonetheless, I thought it'd be useful for us to gain a bit of an understanding by what we mean by the terms bullying, banter and teasing, at least from a definitive stance. So the most classic and seminal definition of bullying cited oh, somewhere upwards of maybe 5,000 times now in the, in the research base is by Oliver's. A negative action when someone intentionally inflicts injury or discomfort upon another, basically what is implied in the definition of aggressive behaviour. These negative actions can be carried out by physical contact, words, in other ways, in relational ways, you can see here, and the intentional exclusion from the group. Essentially what we're looking at with bullying is an imbalance, um, either in physical strength or in some other form of, uh, of power. Banter, um, not the most e easily and readily defined term out there in terms of the research base, we'll show we'll this one, is a playful and friendly exchange of teasing remarks. Because <laughs> then we come to the teasing itself. Teasing is ambiguous. On the one hand, the literal content of teasing is typically negative. On the other hand, there's often a positive component of teasing as well. I guess what I wanted to show in, in essence is um, if you strip these definitions back, you maybe have on the one hand bullying. I think we'll, we'll uh, mostly all accept that that's something pretty negative. Banter frames pretty positively, certainly at least in this case, and teasing maybe somewhere a little bit in between. I don't know if, if people would agree with that. And I think that's the whole point. You may look at these definitions and actually disagree with them um, completely. That's kind of the essence of what I'm going to hopefully get across today. Because actually the research base, the, the further you delve into it, becomes that much more blurred. So we have terms in the research base such as non-malign bullying, cruel teasing, all these types of things that kind of that blur those boundaries. And indeed the intentional aspects of bullying uh, referred to in, in my previous definition has been found to be quite contested in some of the recent research that's happened in sport. I should note that research in sport, particularly in regards to these concepts, is fairly limited. But it's an important notion nonetheless for us to maybe have in mind as we go through the presentation. So in essence, like I said, we've, we've got terms that are quite blurred in terms of our interpretation perhaps of them. So I wanted to just walk you guys through what we do know a little bit already in regards to the findings in sport, just a little bit per concept. So findings fairly recently in regards to bullying have established that it's uh, typically related to poor self-esteem, depression, burnout and various other mental health issues in sport. These are sports-based findings perhaps the kind of things you would expect. Banter, on the one hand, hence the plus sign, is viewed as quite positive in terms of performance, cohesion and bonding, typically in team sports, we, we have those uh, findings coming out. But yet on another, it masks something a lot darker and a lot more troublesome and worrying. And others have found that this banter can often mask homophobic and racist behavior. And actually there's something about the sports context that perhaps normalizes 
these extremes in banter that, that warrants a bit more investigation and, and further research. Teasing, again, has got its kind of, uh, it's got its positive side to it. It's in, in the one sense, it's described almost as an act of banter. You can see almost the interchangeable nature of those terms amongst friends. Yet on another, it acts as a factor which leads to withdrawal from sports. So perhaps if we look at these findings as a whole, we can see that actually no what any one of these concepts is wholly positive, certainly in terms of our, the research in sport today. So what I wanted to do in this study is to try to understand these terms further. And as I said before, try and understand to what degree they're blurred with one another, to what degree they're conceptually distinct. So how did I do it or where more particularly? Well, I believe that the content, well, maybe as a reflection now a bit of going through the study, I think the context is everything in terms of shaping our, our view of these concepts. So I chose the uh, particular context of professional football. You might ask why. Well, what do we know about professional football? From the research base, we've established that it's a hegemonic masculine culture, irrespective of male or female players. Football retains this working class locales and uh, excuse my sociological uh, present, uh, pronunciation, I'm coming from the psycho psychological angle here, but I've got that slightly out, but with a shop floor language and interaction. I.e. There's a, there's a working class way of relating and speaking to one another in the football environment, which is irrespective actually of a lot of the, the players who are who perhaps I've spoken to in this study are coming from quite actually middle-class roots. Um, the sport is characterised by hyper-masculine practices such as speculative banter, hence why I thought it might be quite interesting to look at that concept within, within this particular environment. And the pranks and in-jokes in football regarded as fostering a sense of togetherness. They're, for players previously in research studies, they've been seen as, as the essence of the sport, one of the really attractive things about being involved in it. But yet again, there's a potentially more troublesome sign that these verbal wind-ups are often delivered until players actually snap emotionally or physically on some kind of level. So again, it suggests there's something about this environment that's legitimizing a more extreme form of behavior to what we might expect in other con uh, contexts or maybe workplaces. So in terms of this particular part of my doctoral study, I sought to explore how adult male professional footballers conceptualise bullying in relation to banter, teasing and victimisation. What I found over the course of the study is that element of victimisation largely collapsed into, into bullying, so that's kind of why I've been removed from the title and so on. And more specifically, my question asked to what extent does bullying in football differ from teasing, victimisation and banter? What did I do in terms of methods? Well, I employed a phenomenological approach, something I don't try and say too much in presentations, which involved 18 participants. These were all male professional footballers. They were from under 23 academy teams. They had first team experience or they were first team players. They took part in, in semi-structured interviews with me at their match day um, uh, home ground or their training ground. And that was to try and to, to kind of connect them to their, to their environment and to try and evoke some of those feelings, some of the things they might be going through experience in relation to study concepts. These interviews took 35 to 70 minutes in length and they're analysed via IPA or interpretative phenomenological analysis. So I really wanted to get that individuality out of their, in their accounts to be reflected and also to look at the themes across, across the sample, across the cases. In terms of my thesis as a whole, I thought it would be useful to present the overall superordinate themes before focusing on the particular elements of what we're looking at today. So the primary theme that was established was the football environment. If you like, this was pretty crucial in, in exploring the, the context of professional football, the environment, the workplace and so on, and how it might help us explain these psychological concepts. So that interaction or psychosocial view, if you like, on bullying, banter, and teasing. Establish the theme of the bullying act and the bullying victim. Uh, both, these, um, both these themes are making up separate pieces of work I'm currently focusing on, but the focus for today is on the dividing line 
and, and how that sits in relation to the football environment. So how does that context help us understand, like I said, these concepts, some of those nuances, some of those shades and differences in how individuals view these terms. So the overall, that superordinate theme for the thesis as a whole revealed these subordinate themes in relation to, to my main analysis. We have perception, the degrees to which people see and act as bullying, banter, and so on. Get to that in a little bit. The detection of what is the players call the line, this very kind of powerful statement or view of this very hypothetical and quite hard to quantify thing, which is the line between bullying and, and banter primarily, or, or bullying and teasing. The notion of bantering, again, we'll come back to in a little bit, but essentially how humour plays out within the football context. We come back to the idea of intentionality as again, like I said, sports-based definitions of, of bullying science or, or explorations of bullying science are question this within, within classic definitions of this concept. How the aspects of masculinity, particularly found within the environment, shapes again players' uh, perceptions of what's appropriate behaviour, what's bullying, and so on. How discrimination again features in terms of players' classification of bullying or banter and the degree to which players are, are maybe more accepting of discriminatory acts as what they see as banter, how some of these things may have become normalised, and then finally the continuum, how these things essentially, as it sounds, may line up on a continuum. Can we reflect these concepts in that way? And for the interest of time, I'm just going to look at two or three of these themes um, today, because I'm you know, aware that you guys might, might want to ask some questions and um, and so on. So one of the primary themes within this particular aspect of the dividing line was perception. So we've got a range of different ideas here about perception. I'll read a couple of quotes out of verbatim. So for James, the big thing for me is I just think it's individual perception. What some people class as banter, some people class as bullying. Some people find funny, other people don't find funny. Ranging through to Phil, where he decided to talk about um, when something comes out of one person's mind and they phrase it as I'm only joking, there's almost like an acceptance within the football context. If someone says they're only joking, you kind of have to accept that, no matter almost like what might come out of their, their mind here. Something quite dangerous maybe and something that actually suggests the bullying or banter is very much framed from the perpetrator's lens. And that kind of got re-emphasised in a different way from Ollie because he talked about, I think on social media it would be banter. Uh, but from people from the outside, if they've seen it, if they've seen it, they, mu they might think it's bullying and so on. And I think this is so revealing, this quote about the football context, because for players, I said, they may have come to normalise some of the things they've been saying, they've been saying to one another, they take it to a social media forum. People in the outside world are, are shocked, really, by what's said, and actually may have a very fair point in, in feeling that way, yet players say, hang on, no, it's just banter, it's just, it's acceptable but maybe it actually isn't. Then we get to the aspect of banter in itself. And again, to some degree, this theme is, is still driven by perception um, to, to, like I said, to a large extent. So Charlie, funny stuff that everyone finds funny, that's when it's banter. Like if someone said something to me and I found it funny about me, say if someone was bantering me and I found it funny, like fair enough, that's banter. Kevin reflects how his it plays an important role in bonding with the team. It gels the team, more banter, it can be positive and healthy. Again, really re reflecting that notion that in football in particular, banter is viewed very, very positively. But he also started to allude to the fact it can be a fine line and it can be easily pushed too far. This again is an, in is an interesting reflection of where that line actually is and can you actually see what that line is? And then when we get to James's quote, said the word fatty is associated with somebody they would never show it as affecting them. If they did, they, they would guess it more because it's classed as funny. It'd be having a joke at their expense to make them look better in front of everybody and not really caring about the effects it had on the individual. And this shows in some ways the ruthlessness of the environment, but also the degree to which actually we might never be able to identify if a, if a behavior is bullying or not because players are expected to tolerate that level of, of abuse. Um, and that level of verbal derogation. 
The final theme, just to extend in the interest of time on his present, is on masculinity, a really dominant theme, really reinforcing of the heteronormative behaviours within professional football and, and the really strong ideals that players must still conform to in terms of masculinity in a variety of different ways. So in the case of Rob, he really showed that you can't be seen as a victim, again, really emphasising that we might never really see what bullying it looks like in the players' eyes to football because no one would show it because you know, they'd look seemingly too weak. Phil's quote at the end, very, very evocative about, um, about the requirements and what players see it means to be a male professional football um, and the potential pressure from outside. And again, how this environment might permit a completely different extreme in terms of what we see as, as banter or teasing compared to other environments, contexts, workplaces, maybe even like the one we're in uh, right now for us as a staff. So what do I want to reflect to everyone in, in conclusion? Well, certainly in terms of football, we need to be mindful that these are highly nuanced concepts where the perception of the individual, uh, or perceptions of the individual are shaped by beliefs around the authoritarianism and masculinity of football and professional football as, as a sport. It, the, the quotes I've shown you, I believe, really support that this environment permits a level of verbal derogation and chastisement that's not seen in other parts of life. And I think they also reveal in that play, it's something that players are aware of, that kind of what the person on the street might think, or that, what the person in social media might think, yet players are still subservient to, to those views and to carrying out those acts. I think they also re, the findings also re-emphasise um, something that's coming out of in recent research in, uh, around bullying in sport is that this term can be oversimplified and I believe there's a broader message for society and, and life there too. But yet, we need to be aware that codes of conduct or any kind of intervention that we might offer or educational welfare really does need to be contextualised to the particular club and the players within it, given those nuanced views. Just to conclude with, a couple of strengths and limitations um, for this particular part of the study as um, uh, in itself. So hopefully by, by researching bullying in, in this way, I provided some novelty, particularly in terms of the research design, moving out of traditional focus of bullying in educational environments and perhaps in, in health environments, particularly in the late class aspects like whistleblowing, to the professional football, the workplace context. And I believe the study offers real strengths in terms of the potential applicability of the findings beyond tradi those traditional contexts of study and bullying to the workplace, maybe even the workplace, like I said, we're in right now, um, and to other workplaces that, that bear very similar characteristics to certainly uh, men's professional football. Of course, the study came with limitations in terms of sample size. If you are looking to provide an overall definition of bullying or conceptualization, which I think a lot of people are keen to have, for education purposes and welfare purposes, then um, a sample of 18 participants may not be representative enough for that. But then I think in another way, they already start to show you the individual differences in perception. The all male focus, the all professional football focus, of course, may have limitations just simply for the sport in general. And of course, the site of data collection could be have been a potential issue. Whilst I tried to situate players, if you like, in their workplace natural environment, as I've alluded to across, uh, across the presentation within the study, the environment comes with a high degree of authoritarianism. Players, if you like, might fear their environment to some degree. So it might lead us to question how much those players in those environments, even though, of course, you know, there's one-to-one -one interviews, so it was privately between the participant and myself, how much they might feel under obligation to, to not reveal all. So Hopefully that kind of time is up fairly nicely. Um, I forgot to put my timer running here. If anyone has any questions, of course, I'm happy, more than happy to answer them. Uh, if there's any key references or um, citations I've drawn across possibly the presentation, I'm happy to share those with anyone who may be interested. Thank you guys very much. Uh, thanks, James. Um, so I'll open up to the floor to the questions. I can see Jeff with his uh, hand up there, so I'll, I'll pass over to Jeff uh, first. I'll just look for others. Jim, thanks for that. That was really interesting. Puts a really different perspective on uh, on the environment. A lot, a lot of work seems to be focusing on creating positive cultures. 
Um, what, what kind of intervention do you think you could work towards in terms of creating that more positive culture in, in elite sport and specifically professional football? I think really you need to understand the the particular culture itself as of of the team of the organisation. Now, of course, there's a there's a challenge there, isn't there, with with realism and whether you can do that for every single organisation you go to. But there's certainly a a nuance depending on almost like which organisation you're at. Now, although the findings that they came from three clubs or players came from three clubs in this study, and I wouldn't say that that any particular of the of the uh, the themes belong to one club or the other. Um, understanding that individual context, understanding what's going on within that particular environment, um, the the current coaches, organisation, performance directors, whatever it might be at the helm at the, at the moment, is really really crucial. I'd say before you can before you can really offer a an intervention. I don't. One of the biggest issues players talk to me about in the study as a whole is that the one size fits all uh, PFA, if you like, in the case of professional football talks just just don't work because they become almost like an exercise that the players view as a box ticking type of thing for rights or wrong. So understanding that culture of the organisation itself is really, really crucial. Okay, James, and we've got a question from Chris. Yeah, th thanks for that, James. Um, I think one of my um, the, the question I was, I, that was going through my head is whether you agree with Parker's take on that this is different to other forms of society because his work in particular came from studying other forms of society first, found out about banter. So I, I was just wondering whether sort of you agree or disagree with that, or what sections of society you think perhaps are similar, and are there lessons to be learned from those? I think there's some obvious ones, isn't there, and also linked to, to some of the people he talks about in his work. The the, the parallel environments, uh, the, he likens the environment to construction, doesn't he? And those typically yeah. um, male working class environments, as, as he frames them. But I do think there's while of course I've had to pro provide a justification and I, and I do within my work and within my defending the, the, the study and the project, I think there's much broader messages for, sh for surely all of us to think about in society. So I'd almost maybe go the other way in that there's a lot we can all take out of this about what is bullying. I, like, I've often made the example to, to people who've asked similar questions. You know, if I say I'm having a joke at home with my wife, and I say it's a bit of bands, but what if she doesn't li like that joke? Like it's actually not that to her. And we all we all do it, don't we? We all slip into that oh, I'm only joking type of discourse. But actually, for another person, that that could be that could be a, a, an act of bullying, couldn't it? That there and then it depends on your view of bullying. Do you view it as this yeah, kind yeah. of like this very categorical thing, or do you view it as a kind of thing that can happen in small instances in all of your all of your life. So to answer um, hopefully a bit more concisely, I think there's, there's messages for I think in been, general. There's been a fair, you know, some more studies now that have looked at organisations that are perhaps more uh, or, or less gender specific. So the police is a really good example of an expansion in the number of females into the, the police force. Yeah. But, but banter is still the same. So then you end up, females have to do banter and, and in that they're doing you know heteronormative banter only yeah, yeah. really to, in order to fit in so i wondered whether there's that's a way of expanding and, and learning but you know yeah, the problem yeah. with football is just males <laughs> yeah I, 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 think, I think you're right in the sense that there's been similar findings with female players too they adopt these heteronormative yeah, yeah, yeah. ideals so it it, it yeah it probably there's a lot of hi there's a history behind it isn't it depending on yeah. the nature of the occupation is uh, what males and females adopt as normalised working practices. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, can I just butt, butt in there, James? Um, trying to think whose definition it was um, of bullying, um, but there's, there's something in and around the power differential. So it's the, the intention um, yeah. to have the power. So therefore, going back to your kind of example of like telling a joke to your wife and she doesn't find it funny, that's not necessarily bullying because there's no intention in terms of a power difference just a bad joke and you know, they don't get it or they don't find it funny or it's insulting or, 
or whatever else, which might still be equally kind of bad, but it doesn't sit on the bullying. So I'm just wondering in terms of your research, is there anything there to, to really kind of define bullying in terms of a power differential or, or anything else? In, yeah, in, in, in the other themes on look at the bullying acts, like I said, there's a bit of kind of kept separate for our, for our presentation today, but it's also, it's actually forming a paper currently got under review. Um, that power, power differential certainly came through still in, in those sports-based findings. That there is a bit of contest about it, and there's a bit of contest amongst the players about what makes up the power. The obvious one, perhaps you might think about, is finance. But actually, a lot of players said that's that's not really a crucial aspect in determining uh, in determining what makes up the power that ultimately drives the bully. And it could be longevity. It could be seen as the big dog, as they as they put it. Just something again, very very like, hypothetical or perceptual. So yeah, power. Certainly in terms of my findings, that it, it verified Oluwus's definition to, to that extent. But yeah, the, what we deem as the power, of course, is is another thing. And I guess if you look in terms of human relationships, say like in a in a romantic relationship or whatever, power it depends on that how that power is constructed or perceived, doesn't it? <laughs> so whether we think there is a differential there, even though those relationships should be completely equal, or we'd hope they would be. But yeah, it's a really, really good point. Um, I think we just got uh, one last quick question from Paul uh, as well. Uh, Paul. Sorry, yeah, it's, um, I, I find this fascinating um, because obviously my background is not football, um, but I've experienced this in a complete different sport and it is, um, it's almost exactly the same. Um, and it, if we're... <laughs> I've, you know, I'm, I'm sort of from a sport that is predominantly uh, female athletes, you know, um, a much higher proportion in terms of that female athletes trampoline. Um, and yet still the sort of male dominance comes through with regards to all of our systems, structures, processes and in fact coaching. And I think there's something to be had here with regards to linking this directly to like coach education, to coach development. I had a meeting this morning and it was around sort of understanding the human and the person first um, yeah. and then considering the aspects that you need to adapt in terms of uh, the player or the athlete. And I think there's a definitely crossover here with regards to um, coaching research and understanding sort of education and, and development because um, I was linking with um, the FA last week and we were doing a, a coaching workshop and what came out there from that particular club um, was that they really cared about the person that yeah. they were working with. Uh, and they said they found that very, very difficult when their players then progressed on to a different club because it wasn't the same and they almost felt like they had to prepare them for that. And I was like, that's awful. Like, I thought it was absolutely awful. So I think there's definitely stuff around coach development um, with the FA and with obviously sort of like um, elite coaching that you don't have to be like that in order to achieve top level i, I think that's a totally to, a really really good point i think it, it neatly links together with with jeff's question as well it's, it's just it's that you, understanding that individual environment is really really crucial realistically yeah we, we haven't got the time probably to intervene with with every single one but i think to have a real efficacy in terms of these interventions they have to be you have to at least understand the organization and the context pretty well to be able to to meaningfully um, make an impact and not be viewed again as just that next person from the outside who's who got walk through the emotions. I think particularly this, is, I can speak only of, of professional football in this regard because it's all I research, but players do have a scepticism of, of these educational delivery. You need to maybe get to know them. You need to in some ways gain their trust um, mm -hmm. to really be able to cut through. So I think, I think that's absolutely right. So, to do that and actually I suppose this concluding point is an irony of the study itself but probably those who have let me through the doors if you like already on the way to thinking about how they if they're not doing it already safeguard the welfare of their players and their individuals more than maybe those who who wouldn't want me to come in and do this type of research even though of course it's not like an investigative piece but that sometimes might be the, the worry from the the inside so to speak Okay, um, really interesting uh, discussion uh, thereafter. So um, thanks for a really interesting uh, talk, James. Uh, really good, thank you.